Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. So, Emily, the market for T-shirts, hats, paintings, and uh, even motivational speeches is going to really get pretty small here in Washington, D.C., but for a good reason. So uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but they are finally building out their, what I would consider an adult use market, although it's still, you know, technically, legally medical. Um, and I mean, for a city known for like pure dysfunction, uh, the news this week shows some progress. Although to be fair, I feel like DC residents get, you know, uh, roped into this like dysfunction um, idea of DC. It's not really their fault, right? And I feel like they're trying to do stuff. They're trying to to legalize, they're trying to become a state, but it's perpetually blocked by Congress. But for th- and this this time, looks like Congress is letting it slide. So what happened was there was this bill in DC to change the way that the medical marijuana program works. Uh, and Congress, I guess, has like a time period to basically, um, you know, review and and get and like stop it. And they didn't. And so I guess enough time has passed and now uh, it's legal. And what's legal is you can officially self-declare uh, for medical cannabis now, uh, which is, I think it's been, you know, in, in kind of this temporary stage for some time, but now it's going to be permanent. Uh, but there's some other cool stuff on here too. Like they're going to uh, up the license number to be uncapped. Um, they're going to have a, a pathway for some of these kind of gift shops, I would say, uh, I-70 gift shops, which we'll talk about, uh, to be able to come in to the fold and really just, uh, I don't know, do some interesting stuff like on-site consumption, even, even mentions of, uh, cannabis cooking classes. So I don't know, some, some progress, something interesting. Cause I mean, DC has just been a weird weird place for a long time when it comes to cannabis. I mean, DC is always a weird place and people I know who live there talk about how DC will literally change vibes depending on which administration is off in office and how um, kind of the tides shift around that. But it is really interesting how this has been running and it's, it's been like a start stop. It feels like a little bit. And I do think that, you know, inside the beltway in DC, they really deserve more they deserve to have a real program so that people can you know do business around cannabis um but it but they've definitely <laughs> they've definitely been working this through an interesting way and i'm curious to hear more about these uh gift shops because it sounds like it's a gift with purchase that's pretty unbeat yeah yeah i mean it's it's quite unique right it, it's like the the head shop model um you know you can't go into a head shop and and generally say i want to buy a bong right? They'll say, oh, you know, we only sell water pipes for tobacco, right? There's this like uh, a lingo. Um, And I think the same thing exists for these cannabis gift shops. So way back when DC legalized, it was big news. I remember, you know, okay, backyard, federal government, this is huge. And I mean, years and years and years ago, right? And then, um, you know, pretty limited, you know, seven dispensaries are open now. Um, The the program was, I think it doesn't have a lot of patients. Um, We have some data on that. But but pretty small, uh, but they had legalized possession and they'd legalized gifting and they'd legalized growing. And so they created this kind of perfect storm of like illicit market where, you know, people were getting very clever around uh, not selling cannabis, but selling gifts. And then with those gifts would come cannabis. And so you can't, you know, walk into one of these stores and say, uh, I'd like some blue dream, but you can say, if I was to buy this t-shirt, what kind of gift might come with that? Um, and often they'll say, well, Blue Dream comes with that, right? So uh, it's this this crazy setup. And, and uh, you know, it's gotten, I haven't really followed it for some time. You know, you kind of heard anecdotally that this was happening. But now, I mean, at this point, there are, are well over 100 uh, stores out there that are these gift shops uh, that exist in this manner. And if you do a little research, and we'll, we'll link to some, some articles that kind of highlight them, uh, and click through and, and, and look at them. They look just like dispensaries, except in the, um, in the displays, there's a lot of apparel, <laughs> you know, like the, more than you would maybe normally see. Uh, and, and of course there's, there's cannabis as well, but they don't sell that stuff, obviously. 
Um, it's just a goofy loophole, right? Yeah, I'm picturing like Spencer gifts for anybody who's <laughs> like back in the old days and the, the attraction for the tweens and teens in the mall. Because <laughs> um, there was always something like a little tawdry in there, but you know, it's like go get your. DC tourism shirt and an eighth of weed. Is that like what we're talking about here? It's like, I keep, you know, referencing like the, the gift in the Cracker Jack box, like the goodie. And it's like the gift in the gift shop. That, but, you, uh, you know what? I, I hope it's not too late. Cause it, we should, uh, I don't know. Someone should do that idea, right? Just like a Cracker Jack box of, oh yeah, we only sell caramel popcorn that comes in a box, but you may, may, may find a surprise inside. <laughs> find be, a little nug. That'd be amazing. <laughs> or this idea of like just a tourist walking into a store to get a, a DC t-shirt and uh, comes with weed. Like I'm, this is a really expensive t-shirt, but <laughs> it surprisingly comes with weed. Um, yeah, I think that, and that's not even, I mean, there are weirder things out there, like the motivational speeches that like, that's legitimately, you can buy a motivational speech, um, and someone will come and give you a, a quick motivational speech and then hand you a gift of, of weed. Uh, there's a, a dog that does paintings, um, <laughs> that you can buy one of the dog's paintings and with that painting comes weed. So this, this world, this weird upside down world has existed and um, they, they've tried for some time to kind of crack down uh, to limit it, but it hasn't hasn't gone very well, I think, uh, over the years. And I think that's an interesting parallel to markets like New York that we talk about a lot where mm-hmm. there's a solicit market and it's uh, it's going to be whack-a-mole, right? And really hard, hard to shut these guys down, probably not the biggest priority for a lot of law enforcement in D.C., um, and so they've been working on on changing the rules, and uh, they can't do an adult use market because the federal government won't wouldn't allow it um, mm-hmm. when they when they tried. That's what they want. So they're taking their medical program. They're allowing you to uh, self declare. So I you declare. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to go onto the street and yell it, um, <laughs> and then you can uh, you can go and shop at the dispensaries and. That's great because they're in the program. They're you know they're providing tested products. Um, you know I think that that's there's going to be you know tax uh, dollars that come in, and so it kind of levels the playing field a bit. And so they're working to bring in these i i seventy shops as they're known um, into this program. Again, they're they're going to have unlimited licenses, which is good. Uh, I also saw that they're going to give uh, the dispensaries 280E tax relief, which we're seeing that in a lot of uh, local uh, markets, you know, where, you know, the states are doing that. So to see D.C. doing that as well is is great. Um, you know, yeah. just that is a very interesting as I've continued to study the laws around 280E and trying to understand why it still applies to our industry and, and tax law reform It is, and that the states are acknowledging you know, each state that says that this is really gratuitous and difficult to run and grow a business with this. So at least they're going to provide relief at the state level. But DC being a federal jurisdiction, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's some special, it's not a state, right? It's a district. It's a Um, district, Yeah. which is, it's just interesting because it's like as direct as you can come to the federal government is right there um, and they're going to provide relief around it as a, as a district. I don't know. I just wonder, you know, if we have, if we're just seeing laddering support around ultimately a, a 280 change, but that's just a quick sidebar on this whole, that's this whole DC thing. I do have to say like <laughs> coupled with seeing this update about the motivational speaker, I saw that Billy McFarlane from the fire fest is doing <laughs> In, like motivational speaking opportunities. <laughs> I was like picturing him rolling in and with a bag of weed and like, here's your motivational <laughs> speech. Yeah, right. That's <laughs> <laughs> just got out of prison. Right out of prison. Yeah, right in. I mean, hey, you know, he's always looking for some market opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. There's um, a business card in there for sure. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Don't, don't give him any ideas. Um, but yeah, now, now maybe that yeah won't work with this new, new framework anyways, no. but it's, uh, it's, it's cool. So there's 700,000 people in DC, but there's uh, five and a half million people in the DC Metro area, right? DC is pretty small. Um, and so this, you know, this is interesting that, 
I think that there are there's a reciprocity for medical. Uh, I don't know, you know, if I, if you can, I guess you can self declare. I don't know if it like applies to only residents. I would imagine it doesn't because they have a lot of non residents in their program. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that would be one thing, right? I think the other thing is that uh, there's this hundred dollar registration fee, which right now is waived until April thirteenth. Uh, so you have two weeks to go in and get your or to self declare at no cost and become and get part of the program or into the program. Um, after that, it's a hundred dollars, and you know that may be a bit of a barrier, right? I mean, you may still like an adult use market in other areas. You might want to just walk in and check it out, right? You don't have to pay a hundred bucks to be part of that program or, or be really convinced. Although you know, you know, a lot of the sales go to the core consumer. And so those people, you know, may be motivated to to pay the hundred dollars. I don't know what this is going to do for pricing. Like, I don't know, you know, pricing right now in these I seventies versus dispensaries. And I mean, if everyone rolls into the same program, great. But if you know these I seventy gift shops, you know, continue to proliferate for some reason, you know, that could cause a bit of an issue. But we'll see. You know, maybe they end up continuing to waive the registration fee just to bring more people in because I think that's really their goal is to get everyone on side here. Right and into the program, and probably the less barriers, the better. But I understand it's a medical program. You know, medical programs generally have you know fees associated for running, so that's probably where that's coming from. But it is waived today, so if you're in the area, I would go get it now, uh, even just to see you know what what's gonna what's gonna happen with the program. Yeah, well, of course, the one biggest barrier is if you work in lazy Joe OG's white house, <laughs> sleepy Joe and OG, sleepy, sorry, not lazy, <laughs> sleepy, um, much better. <laughs> but if you do, you can't get a medical card and you cannot be a cannabis consumer, right? Oh, that's right. They, yeah, they had that whole thing where they fired a bunch of staffers. Yeah. Yes, right. yes, yes. And uh, that was all on self-report. I don't even think that was, I don't even think they'd gotten to the next level, but, um, you know, so that's going to be a barrier. Yeah. If you're working in the federal government and you're in this license program. Yeah, that's true. It's a, it's a thing. So you may still be looking to get that t-shirt with the, with the eighth. Right. Um, Right. Yeah. Because I know that was a big lingering concern here in California before the, because our medical program was so open. And like I've said before, I, I used to get my card at the doctor in Amoeba Music on Haight Street. Mm -hmm. And um, you follow the little green footsteps to the doctors. Office. And there was there was no central uh, database, right? Uh, no. Every doctor, I remember that too. It was like they would call in a number based on like the doctor you went to, and it was like an approval, pretty basic, right? Yeah, but people were still. I remember people who worked at like find, uh, you know, the larger like a Wells Fargo or like Barclays. Like they because they had such strict policies, they were very worried about even having a medical card associated, and then. You know, there are just like lingering concerns about even like, as we know, things like and what a day to talk about it, but gun registration, things like that, where it can create issues to be in these like databases as as medical card holders. So there right. are barriers that still exist in this world around it, even though we all know that it's, you know, far better for people than opiates and the other things that are floating around the country these days. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the numbers too for the medical cannabis program, uh, they publish these uh, out there, and we'll we'll put a link to this. Uh, total unique patients in February was uh, twenty nine thousand four hundred fifty nine, so under thirty thousand uh, patients, and total unique patients DC residents mm-hmm. uh, six thousand two hundred seventy five. Um, which seems low, but they have, you know, other, from other markets here. Uh, let's see, non-DC residents. Oh yeah, these, these numbers, <laughs> we'll link to this. They don't really add up, but it says total unique patients in non-DC is 3,236. There's an asterisk next to February's total numbers of mm-hmm. some that have lapsed. Maybe that's all time. Uh, through the program versus now, uh, if it is like, you know, February snapshot, I mean, you're looking at under 10,000 people from DC and non DC combined. Uh, and that's, you know, to go into the seven dispensaries, right? So, um, you know, probably a fine number for that many dispensaries, but if they're going to remove the cap and they're going to try and get everyone to become a, a proper dispensary, you know, those numbers will probably need to go up in a meaningful way to make it worthwhile. 
looks like they did uh, in in total store sales too. Let's see, February numbers four point seven uh, million dollars in, in total sales. Yeah, not too bad for you know small small residency, but still you know I think some some room to grow uh, for sure. So what do you think? Um, you know, when I think about where DC is and I think about Maryland and Maryland, you know, on track for an adult use market, do you think this will have any sort of impact on Maryland? I mean, they're, they're definitely beating, again, they're not an adult use market to be extra clear here, but it is kind of where you can just self-declare medical. It's, it's looser than I remember even, you know, going to Amoeba Records. You don't even have to do that, right? You just, hey, you know, I'm in the program. Um you know, or Maryland, you know, there's still some, some, you know, rigor to get into the medical uh, yeah. program and adult use is still a ways off. Do you think it has any impact? Or do you think that barrier with the hundred dollar fee and all that, do you think we'll see any more numbers? And do you think Maryland will accelerate because of it? I think if the product is worth it, you'll see the numbers improve. Like if people start to see like that, they like what they're able to get in the shops. I think that's usually what drives uh, change. But on Maryland, it could drive some pressure there, although I don't get the feeling Maryland's rushing to do anything. They have said they want to move this along more quickly than the originally indicated, so that's productive. But, you know, the other thing to think about is Virginia on an adjacency because they just True. kicked it out. You know, like that's, I think their adult use program just got kicked out, like, right, um, kind of significantly. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, right. So that yeah. could be, yeah, a border state that has, you know, more people coming across. Yeah. Um, because, you know, honestly, and it was funny because the way I kind of deal with these things, because there's so much to track is like if a state's like we're elongating the timeline, then it's just like, OK, file that away for now. We'll focus <laughs> yeah. on what's you know what I mean? <laughs> like Totally. I can't, totally. And that's for the operators to focus on with their local resources. Um, but, you know. We had been looking at some things in Virginia. I do think it's an interesting market, but if the timeline's getting blown out and it seems like it's gone back and forth, um, but this could be an interesting um, piece to it on an adjacency standpoint, um, maybe even more so than Maryland because Maryland is progressing toward a legal adult use market. Yeah, yeah, fair point. But then uh, the bigger question is, does it have any impact on... Uh, federal legislatures, the Congress senators that are, you know, in town seeing this stuff. Like, I, I don't know what their experience is now, you know, seeing a lot of uh, these gift shops, this kind of illicit market, I'd imagine doesn't give the best appearance for the industry, right? Like, it's always great when you, when you can take a legislator and take them to, uh, you know, a above board place and they can see it and they can see all the jobs. And, and you know, it's, it seems to be quite eye opening for a lot, right? And they don't, necessarily always go out of their way to do that kind of work. But when it's in their backyard, right, they do have to spend some time in DC, um, you know, during their term, like maybe I think if they had, you know, more uh, tr translating to more like a dispensary model, a little nicer, you know, things are tracked, you know, taxed a bit better control um, might be a better representation of what an adult use market does look like versus kind of the adult use market that they're in now, which is a lot of gifting, weird delivery stuff, dog paintings, uh, motivational speeches, you know, the kind of goofy stuff that doesn't really have the, give the best appearance. Do you think that'll have any impact or is it just hopeless? Like, ah, it could be, they could be surrounded by them and they could be the nicest looking places and they could still just say, yeah, it's not, not for us. I think the selective ignorance is the strongest, one of the strongest things I witness in politicians, like the unwillingness to be open and to understand things. It has repeatedly been a change agent when the politicians in their own home states see the benefit of legalization. For example, like Jared Polis seeing like um, Colorado and, and, you know, California. I mean, when you go to the stores, it's... and. You know, I think it's the whole walkthrough of the stores, too, to see everything from the compliance tracking software that's implemented, the vaulting of the product, the consideration about advertising, and the security systems that exist in place. I mean, that's one of the things that I know has changed the perceptions of law, force or law enforcement around cannabis is like, for example, I remember way back at Harborside when we first started working with them in the Oakland facility, which was a huge retail location and, and a destination, frankly, um, 
I remember, but Oakland is, you know, it, it's hit or miss a little bit sometimes in the activity um, around there. And I remember the police used to swing by if they were looking for someone to see if they could get into the surveillance equipment to see what had occurred on adjacent properties. And they were like, you guys have the best equipment because you're kind of on your own as a cannabis operator to protect your business. Um, and we've seen that repeatedly, but all of those things laddered up to the politicians getting much, much more comfortable with how the retail experience is. And like, then you just see the data too around the real legal shops, the incidence of people under 21 getting into the stores is almost none. The data points around that are truly impressive. And I think it's because the operators are just like, it's, you know, they're so much better about it than the liquor stores or even the um, vape shops, which were terrible about selling to underage kids, um, especially through the whole vape uh, situation. But, you know, these operators, with everything they go through, it's not worth it to blow up their license to sell to someone who's underage and they haven't verified their state license. So, you know, all of those things ladder up to making politicians more comfortable. And I think you're right if it's in their backyard in D.C. But I wonder how much the politicians actually spend outside of like the bars and restaurants in like the upper part of uh, D.C., you know, unless they're what is there's like a great scene in, in Veep when they go to like the ice cream shop. I don't know if you watch that show Veep on HBO. Yeah, I oh don't. I don't. Oh. I know I need to. From what I hear, too, it's a pretty accurate depiction of D.C., but, you know, unless they're going for, like, a folksy meet the people thing, I just don't know how much they actually get into the weeds of D.C. versus when they're back in their home states and they've got to do some FaceTime with the local constituents who actually vote them in. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't think it could do any damage. Um, no. But I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't know if it accelerates anything meaningfully, but... Um, I don't know. It's just like one less area to point to, you know, it's like, ah, this, if this is working and they've got a good program, then they'll be like, yeah, you know, they can't, can't complain about it right now. They could say, well, in DC it's, it's chaos and we don't want the whole country to look like that if we legalize. And it's like, well, no, that's not what it no. would look like. Uh, it'll well, look that's... more like, yeah, what it's going to be now. Yeah. And that I think was a lot of our hope for New York was that knowing that the financial center is based in New York and there's right. still a lot of gate holders who are gatekeepers who are afraid to kind of cross over to be involved in cannabis. And we were hoping that with a legal regulated market, they'd be able to see what we see in like Illinois or Florida or California or, you know, Washington, Oregon, anything just to see what these retail stores look like. And just what I was speaking about and then the financial sector could get more comfortable with it as well as even the even the Nasdaq and the NYSE, like having people be able to swing by and see it. But I just don't think the experience that exists is is the compelling case for that right now in New York. So yeah, I think you're right. Like I think it's only an up it's only a positive thing to improve the perception of people seeing a legal and regulated market in action. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's great that that this passed and got through the Congress didn't block it. Um, I'm excited to see, you know, what the impact is now, now that it's more of an official program. Uh, but, but really the bad news here, if it does go well, you know, no more motivational speeches, no more paintings by a dog and no opportunity for, for your Cracker Jack product. Cause that, <laughs> that, that would have done really do well. <laughs> Maybe it's not too late. Thanks for listening to the high rise podcast presented by headset for more information on headset. Visit headset.io.